So, but I must confess, after hearing all these philosophical, theoretical talks here, that I'm not very good at the art theory or abstract criticism or such things. So, when I want to understand the cultural phenomena, I, I, I try to be, uh, or any kind of culture, art or science or everything, I, I stay with the concrete words as, as much as possible. So I will use most of my allotted time today to, to uh, tell you some of the concrete art science works that uh, I've been involved in the last 50 years as director of the Medical Design in Copenhagen. And then at the end I will kind of inductively kind of begin to summarize <coughs> and reflect on, on the uses the uses, the utilizations of art science today. Um, but maybe a short kind of autobiographical um, note. I, I came to Copenhagen back in 1999, um, having had 25 years of research experience in, uh, in teaching in history, philosophy, and social studies of science. Well, basically, I had a science background. Um, to take a professorship in history of medicine at the University of Copenhagen and to take the responsibility of a very backward institution at the university, which was called the University's Medical History Museum. It was a, <coughs> a heap with 250,000 medical artifacts from the 17th century to the present. And, and, and the dean asked me to take care of that, well, in addition to being a professor in history of medicine. So, after some trepidations, I said, yes, okay, I can help, try to help you out. If I can get free, free, free reign and do whatever I want. Um, so my aim was to taking over this quarter of a million artifacts in a beautiful old building, <coughs> try to transform a classical medical history museum into something else. And uh, now what that else was, I wasn't entirely sure about that at the time. I did have some gut feeling, which I tried, tried to express at that time in a new name for the museum. Um, I call it Medical Museum. Um, those of you who have classic degree you know that this is a, from the Little Scots Dictionary. Um, it denotes a place where you're going to be inspired by the, well here's this great thing. Um, Good to be inspired with the Temple of the Muses, a school of art and poetry, where choirs chime in with dirges. Uh, choirs of swallows, who's twittering? This is very, I uh, was a type of barbarous tongues, epithesis and negative. Um, so it was a place where you go to be inspired by the muses of poetry, dance, singing, mathematics, history, etc. And more specifically, uh, to continue this autobiographical introduction, I wanted to first open up the, that pretty myopic, myopic in the south that they were only interested in the history of real medicine, to open it up to contemporary culture and, uh, and to more systematic collaboration with research in the humanities. Not only history, but also philosophy, aesthetics, culture, studies, etc. And second, I wanted to focus less on medicine's glorious, or not, not so glorious past, and much more on all of those fantastically exciting things that are going on right now in contemporary, in contemporary medical science and technology, including nano, nanomedicine, and uh, <coughs> genomics, digital technology, and so on. And finally, and most importantly, that whatever we did, we should be driven by curiosity. Curiosity, curiosity, curiosity. Otherwise, there's not the research institutions. But besides these kind of more general um, ideas for what we should do, and I think I was pretty open-minded and ready to pick up whatever interesting inspirations might come along during, during the, uh, the work. And one of those inspirational tendencies that popped up on my in the screen at the time was that to bring art and science together. And much of it, from my horizon, happened to come from London. London, I think, looking back historically on what the art science scene's development, I think London was a very important early incubator for 
emerging the life science movement. London was beaming with excellent scientific institutions. I mean, they have six, seven big, great universities, all of them of the same quality or much higher quality than the University of Copenhagen. They had a vibrant art scene, and um, uh, Trace Aitman came, <laughs> was mentioned the other day, and a huge potential audience of highly qualified and, and discerned um, um, cultural consumers. And London provided generous funding opportunities, not least through, in this field, the Wellcome Trusts, the Philanthropic uh, Foundation, the Wellcome Trusts SciArt funding program, which was started actually, and this was very, 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 very early, started already in 1996, almost 20 years ago, started a SciArt funding program with the aim of funding visual arts projects that involved, as I said, involved, quote, an artist and a scientist in collaboration to research, develop, and produce work that explored contemporary biological and medical science. No physics there, but contemporary biological and medical science. I don't think one can overestimate the importance for the field we are talking about here today. Um, the, or be, you can't overestimate the importance of that program for, for uh, our field. As the Trust wrote in a, a report in 2009, looking back on the program, over 10 years, SciArt supported 124 projects, funding £3 million worth of awards. The scheme is a considerable range of people involved in the arts and science sectors that have been integral in supporting the development of unique community practitioners, new form of interdisciplinary practice, and a body of artistic work relating to science, as well as having a significant influence on the public engagement with science. Well, the last line there was what really why Wellcome Trust put so much money on it. They wanted to foster public engagements with science. <clears throat> now, this rapidly growing interest, uh, which uh, was going around in London at the time, um, in art and science, uh, as you say, the program in 1996 was funded on an already existing body of work and practice, of course. So, in reality, it goes back to the 1970s, 80s. And, uh, the museums and, and both art museums and science museums and general culture museums in London rather early took, uh, took notice of this. So one example, which I, was one of the early very nice examples, was the Haywood Gallery on the South Bank. Um, uh, had an exhibition, huge exhibition on anatomical art, art called Spectacular Bodies, with curator of Oxford art historian Martin Kemp. Uh, and Marina Wallace, Marina Wallace at the St. Martin's College of Art and Design. And that, that really was something people talked a lot about. I think that was a very new thing. And another example on a smaller scale, uh, a couple of years earlier actually, was, was uh, designer and artist, Canadian designer and artist Martha Fleming, who, uh, who was employed as uh, artist in residence at the Science Museum. Uh, on the exhibition road. Um, she created a series, 16 or so, I think, installations where she, she, she roamed the, the storage rooms of Science Museum and picked up things from a purely aesthetic point of view. The curators, Science Museum curators, who were all historians, were just flabbergasted. How can you do that? You have to explain which, which project. Is this for 1787? Why don't you say that in the label? And she didn't care at all. Um, she put her own things together with other own things without having no cognitive relation to each other at all, and blue things with, with blue things. And they were just, you can't do that, this is a museum. Um, so that was an inspiration that she kind of, they threw her out actually, it wouldn't literally. But the, the exhibition was so pop popular among the public, so they, they let it stand there. So what happened in London in the late 1990s and early 2000s fueled, I think, the imagination of a handful of people in museums of science and technology and science, museums of medicine around Europe. I remember a few of us met in London in 2004, 10 years ago now, to discuss the then young and very unknown historian Ken Arnold, 
who had plans for a new big exhibition that year in central London, and he had a vision for, as it were, seamlessly to merge art, science, and history exhibitions and events in one single venue. And that came through. Well, the Wellcome Trust had huge money then, so a very big pocket. And three years later, in 2007, the Wellcome Collection on Houston Road opened, and the rest is history. In a few years, it was one of the most smashing successes in the London um, uh, exhibition scene. They have about one and a half million visitors, over two million visitors in the last six, six years. I mean, they can't compete with Tate, but who can compete with Tate? Um, both among the public and the reviewers have, have, have been um, thrilled. Um, so there was a lot of things going on there uh, in the early 2000s and I myself was exposed to a growing number of conferences and workshops, not least in Berlin, Ingeborg Reichlin in Berlin was one of those that really brought a lot of people together. And here in Copenhagen, as I mentioned in a footnote yesterday, Martha Fleming and I organized a research workshop on biomedicine and aesthetics in the museum context and a conference on art of biomedicine together with Michael Borg at the Royal Danish Academy of Fine Arts. That was, I think, back in 2007. And I remember, was it Jakob that came here? I remember Jakob Wombers here sitting on the third row in that meeting and was pretty skeptical that that's this new thing. I think he's going to change his mind now. Um, um, anyway, enough of introductory autobiographical anecdotes. Um, what I will do now is, I want, well, as I promised you before, uh, that's to show you a number of artworks that I've been involved in in medical science science uh, during the last um, 10 years. And uh, I will start with these seven works. I actually put myself as an artist here. Not very humbly, but let's see when you get that. Jakob Kierkegaard, Martha Fleming, David Goodson, myself, Susan <coughs> Freeman, Nicola Hobart, Franz Joseph Laponte, that, who was mentioned yesterday actually by the Professor Lili Lebron. Um, starting with Jakob, um, Jakob Kierkegaard's Labyrinthetis, which was, we commissioned it. I, I don't remember how we got in contact with Jakob, um, but what he did was to, he was fascinated by the fact that he read somewhere that um, the hair cells of the inner ear, those little tiny cells that have hairs on them that vibrate when the sound comes in, you know, sound is translated, transformed into movements of the bones of the inner ear. And in the final land, that those vibrations translate into movements of these little. Uh, microscopic hairs on the hair cells, and those give uh, impulses to the brain. That's why we're here. Um, and um, so it turns out when these cells, the hairs vibrate and give us signals, they in turn, when they vibrate, they send a signal out, of course, because everything that vibrates gives a signal out. And that's so, so, so tiny, of course, that you can't hear it but um, a, a very fine sound uh, receiving uh, device can do that. So there is a laboratory at the Danish Technical University that can actually catch the sound of the vibrating hairs on the, in the hair cells. So he took, he recorded his own ears recording sounds, let's just say, and recorded that kind of outgoing sound from his ear. And, um, doing, and then he, made a musical composition of that. Here is an action, trying the work, and uh, here it is installed in the, um, in the roof of the Medical Design uh, uh, Auditory, and I play the...
it says here on the website, use good speakers and turn up the, the sound. It goes on like this in different varieties up and down for an hour. It was pure torture. But Jaeger was very proud of his work. <laughs> People were yelling and screaming and running out of the auditorium after a quarter of an hour. Um, but the fun thing is, of course, he uses some scientific, technological understanding of uh, of 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 of, of uh, uh, um, looking into how hearing uh, is produced, and then kind of plays with that and produces a a, a sound artwork out of that. And my second example is let's just see. Oh, this is fine. My second example is. I mentioned Martha Fleming, um, who is actually Canadian, but she's based in the UK now. Um, we did an exhibition uh, called um, Split and Splies, Fragments from the Age of Biomedicine. And for that work, she made a, 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 a couple of art installations, um, uh, where in this one, she conceptualizes the notion of container you know, in physics, everything is about uh, gravitation and, and, and atomic energy wave, and waves and, and, and particles. And you don't really need something to put them in. There's always something acting on the distance, like photons. You don't need to. But in biomedicine, as, as you know, um, um, you do, you, yeah, the, the, everything has to be contained. Because the body is contained, it's contained in cells, it's contained in bodies and in an organisms. And when you take it out to do something about it in the laboratory, you still have to contain it. So the container is a very, kind of very basic metaphor for biomedical practice. Um, well, not by not imaging, of course, but, but otherwise. Um, so she, what she did, what she did, she did this uh, installation there, 100. And, and uh, um, eight um, 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 objects from our collections, all containers of different kinds, plastic, uh, metal, glass containers, different kinds, but they're all containers, and they are placed in a container. And the problem with one person in the room who notice what is this container is a model of a container. Can you see it? It's this one. Uh -huh. It's a 90, so it's not 106, it's a called 96. It's 8 times 12 rows. It's, a, it's actually test tubes and you know, all the micro scale uh, put together to provide auto, for automation uh, work. So she did play medical and scientific objects as art objects. You can test conceptualize the container as a basic lab object in biomedicine. And she upscales a model of the most ubiquitous biomedical lab object in a, a, a lab object, the micro well. Um, and that kind of is the, the, uh, the kind of upscale model of it. Um, here's another installation uh, of physiological measuring devices, um, etc. So this is her way of, of, of um, trying to work with material objects and doing kind of sculpture artworks out of them. Um, my third example is um, David Goodsell, um, American biologist at Scripps Research Institute in, in uh, San Diego, La Jolla. Um, who um, makes what you could call hyper-realistic renderings of cellular structures. His work technique is that he first reads a lot in uh, scientific journal articles about a phenomenon, in this, in this case how insulin molecules are secreted through the cellular wall. He reads up the literature, made 200, 500 scientific articles, and then he looks at microscopic picture, electron microscopic pictures, light microscopic picture, and then he kind of immerses himself 
into this literature and image. And then kind of he takes a step back, take a deep breath, and then he begins to paint aquarelles from this. So it's not a rendering in, the, in, in a realistic sense, it is kind of in, imagination begins. But he never he never draw he never paints something that is wrong. Um, so it's not a schematic textbook images. It's not really pure imagination. Uh, it's somewhere in between, and it's it, it, it more I would call it more hyper realistic than re realistic. It give me associations to a, a Spider Man movie or something like that. Um, so. Here is the same image. We used it in an, an exhibition, uh, blowing it up on glass uh, with behind the glass uh, illumination for an exhibition on proteins and insulin called The Chemistry of Life. And um, I wrote a short uh, introduction to him in Nature um, where I kind of, well, yeah, I'm, as I said, um, um, hyperrealist, I can't. My re reminiscences were of the pre Raphaelite painters and, and uh, Gustav Klimt. Anybody gets association with Gustav Klimt here? Well, I do. <laughs> um, that kind of hybrid ornamental organic style. So, so it gives you kind of a retro feel, uh, which I think is quite interesting. And we also used here as another work called Glucagon Release, where he uses the same methods for portraying. So when people are coming from, from science see, oh, well, this, this is very interesting. Well, this is probably what it looks like. <laughs> this is probably what it looks like. So we put this in the context of the, an exhibition on balance and metabolism that we opened in 2011. Now, a fourth work is, actually my own, uh, what I call genomic enlightenment, um, where I collaborated with genomic scientists um, in a, a Center for Basic Metabolic Research at the University of Copenhagen, who had been sequencing or genotyping um, um, 18,000 patients. Uh, half of them had so-called metabolic syndrome, uh, obesity, uh, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, and on the other half were normal controls like us here. And um, through this uh, so called microarray genomic technique, they could um, identify 67 genes that are kind of involved in, in that are transcripted in the me metabolic syndrome and therefore in the some, somehow responsible in collaboration for the metabolic syndrome. Um, and here's an equal genomic enlightenment on a play on the uh, Immanuel Kansas aufklärung care is the Ausgang dimension of seine selbstbeschuldete Unmündigkeit, um, playing on the idea as uh, is genomics today's aufklärung? Is this what enlightenment looks to that. Our immaturity is not knowing about our genes. Our women become mature when we can understand and control our genomic destiny. And another artwork is of a quite different kind. It is this one we commissioned back in almost two years ago, and we commissioned it two years ago by Susie Freeman and Liz Lee from the art group Pharmacopeia in, in, in London and Bristol, uh, called Femme Vital. It looks like an ordinary dress, larger than life dress, uh, in the museum's entrance hall. And it's actually made up by 27,700 prescription pills that a, a, a specific patient a woman patient who has suffered from metabolic syndrome over the last 10 years has got prescribed. So all the pills that she took, well, not those pills because they are kind of digested, but similar pills um, uh, are we woven by Sue Liz uh, into, um, um, into the, uh, the, the textile and, uh, and display. So on, 
on a superficial look, it, it doesn't, you can't see it, but when you get closer, you see all of these bills. These are real bills. They cost a fortune to buy them. Um, so that is, of course, a comment on the whole question of polypharmacia. An, an elderly patient eats up to 10 different medicines per day. And uh, the comment of multimorbidity, that you have several diseases at the same time, and when you age, this becomes a a bigger, big, big problem for you. Now another one, um, more better known in the Danish context, is Nikolai Hovald. Um, his light break, we displayed that in 2014. He made it speci specifically for our museum. Um, he used, he found out when he was browsing our, our, our collections that he could use um, the um, crystal lenses that uh, Nobel Prize winner Nils Finsen, the Danish medical doctor who won the prize in 1903, the lenses he used to, to focus and concentrate this light of sun or from very, very, very strong uh, lamps and to focus it on the skin of the, uh, the patient that was suffering from uh, skin tuberculosis. So it was a, a, a treatment for skin tuberculosis. And he suddenly realized he could use these crystals for experimenting with light generally and how to focus light and how to, to put in uh, filters and other lenses in between. So he took images of the sun. So it's actually a medical technology used to depict the sun by means of different filters in between. And the result, and he made them on secrets. So these are not copies, these are the originals that he, he, you can't, well, if you make copies, you have to make photocopies or photographic copies of them. And uh, this, with, we opened that in, 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 in April last spring. So that's yet another way of working with it. And, and the fourth, the last example of this seven is uh, uh, François-Joseph uh, Laporte was mentioned yesterday and uh, we commissioned him here to do two kinds of artwork. One is the, the performance uh, called Thousand Handshakes where he, he walks around and literally says hello to 1,000 people, actually 1,255, but he, could, he couldn't stop. I mean, after a while you can't really stop saying hello to people. And, after each handshake, they can wash their hands if they want, but he doesn't wash his hands. But after 50 handshakes, we sample the microbiome, the microbial flora in his hand, and put them and, and, and send them to sequencing. And see how his microbial flora in his hand changes as he enters into interaction with other people. If they can summon peaks, if you meet an ambulance, it is a virus, but if you meet somebody with a nasty bacteria, does that make an impact on the way the, uh, the, the bacterial flora um, develops over time? So you have four assistants working with him here. We, have, we explain to people what they were exposed to and uh, what they uh, offered them washing their hands afterwards. And in connection with that, he did a, an, an, an exhibition called uh, Microbiome Selves, Selfies uh, in a, uh, well, I can, uh, I, I can very superficially just say that this is a kind of visualization of the, um, the kind of bacterial classes that he has in his hand after a contact with the person, and that visualization itself is a kind of, 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 of self-portrait. And, and, and I can't go into de detail with it, uh, but um, you, you can see it as a kind of rendering, a visual rendering of the microbiome itself. And we put that in an exhibition we just opened called Hello Bacteria, which you can still see in medical design and very well. Uh, then some just small, these were, I think, these seven were the most important works. Uh, some small one is, called, for example, Colin Renner's 8th ATP synthase, which was a glass work. What he does is he take the, the um, we mentioned X-ray diffraction earlier today, he take the X-ray diffraction um, images 
which are many, many thousands of them, lay them upon each other and do them in glass. And when he put these, when he cut them, you can see, he cuts them out in glass like this. And then he staples them upon each other. And when you do that, you get a peculiar effect, which is rather unintended. You can, you can actually see the structure of the molecule, the 3D structure of the molecule through the glass. Um, another one is Andrea Jesperson's name was mentioned in a personal discussion here uh, earlier today. Uh, Danish UK artist, Uma Sirohail. Uh, another example, uh, Lucy Lyons from uh, the UK, we had as a postdoc two years ago. And uh, she worked with a specific technique of drawing called delineation, that is contour drawing. And she made uh, hundreds, many thousands of drawings of, 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 of elderly people and their, and their physiognomy and, 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 their, and their things and items. Um, Colin Chipper and Louise Whiteley, two curators in our, our, our museum, did a biohacking exhibition together with biohackers here in Copenhagen. It was not designed as an art science installation, but I, I think it was considered as a kind of attempt to move the biohacker laboratory from the garage into the museum. But I think retrospectively, I think I would like to interpret as a science art especially after having seen works like Harry Turks, uh, Uncertainty Harry Turks Experiment 1, where he goes very closely into the laboratory materiality and, 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 and make kind of still labels, uh, still lives of matter, or the hand movements of the, uh, these, the laboratory workers. So from that point of view, I think we can begin to look at this biohacking laboratory as an art science installation. Now, the final one I want to mention here is, um, is this one. Um, do we have internet? Yes, we have. So that was a project that I started a couple of years ago and the SP Moore um, has, paper has done the, the, the movies. The project is to move, view the laboratory aesthetically in an analytic way, that is to, to take one as an aesthetic dimension after the other. In this case we take colors, take view, render the laboratory from the perspective of red or blue, or yellow, or green. And then after a certain sounds, a pitch of sound, say um, that, that wavelength of sound, etc. And so we, we, what system, the idea was to systematically go through the laboratory from a kind of Bongartian sensory point, point of view, that is the sensate cognition of the laboratory. And then see what happens, maybe even in a, in a database way, See what, what happens if you bring these together, offer analytically separating all the aesthetic dimension of the laboratory that made 300 different analytical dimensions, and then bring them back again. So we're just at the beginning of that project. Now, if, I'll oh, see, Chairman. Yes, yes, it's, it, I have good thank you. So he said I should, I should, um, I should, um, Rest a little between each word in order to kind of grow it out. Good to have some time there. Now, that's my experience background. Um, well, that's all the kids. Um, so, 
So these are the kind of concrete artworks that we commissioned and some of them I've been working on myself. And now I will use my few remaining minutes with a reflection on, I mean, I've done this because I think it's fun, nothing else. But if I should do it for more kind of elevated reasons, or more serious reasons than having fun, and having a funding money that allows me to have fun, I think, um, I, I, I will, I've been thinking about what are, I tried to make a stakeholder analysis. You know, that's very uh, popular in Copenhagen Business School, sort of things like that, to do a stakeholder analysis. Who have interests in, in, in what are science people having fun? Uh, who have stakeholder interest in them? And, and one is, of course, um, the obvious ones are, of course, for art's sake and for science's sake. I mean, Oron Ketz, um, I think he was mentioned earlier today or the other day, uh, one of the most prominent bio-artists uh, bio um, working with, um, in, with uh, living material. So he's done this thing called victimless leather where he makes a cell capture of, of skin-producing cells. So he actually producing a, a, a leather overcoat, so as to say, in the laboratory. <coughs> And uh, he incubates, he says, he's very deep into, into cell tissue culture and he works at the University of Western Australia. So that is a kind of, and he does it, I mean, he's asking why he does this, he says, he does it for fun and he does it to promote art. And he has a whole school of teaching apparatus around him and this is part of their, their art program and, uh, and he's walking around, uh, traveling around art conferences all the time to speak about the renewal of, of art, etc. So for science's sake, I mean, we have heard this this morning about a lot of science's sake, um, that um, um, in a sense, when scientists and science institutions are, 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 are looking at art, they I think they're just interested in making the rest of us interested in what they're doing. I mean, art is just a kind of bait. Um, I mean, they put a lot of more or less realistic images on the cover. We heard that this morning, cover on scientific journals. And this is one of the most Im imaginative that I've seen. It's a cover of Cell from 2007. It's a, a manga artist in Japan called Hiro Hirohiko Araki. In Araki, I can't pronounce it. Um, he drew it from the request of two authors of, it, of a paper who had written a paper about a protein called Scrapper that regulates synaptic activity in the nervous system. And they, they just loved Araki. And they asked him to do a cartoon or mango cartoon, or what is it? What's his mango art? I don't know. Um, so he turned that kind of scrapper protein into what a purple humanoid could put in blue heart shaped ubiquitous, which is kind of, kind of proteins on the red REM creature. I don't know, remember what RIM is. But, uh, um, so, but there are less imaginative. I mean, there are also. On almost every camera of nature, or science, or cell, or, or journal, or this and that, there is a beautiful picture of one of those slides that we saw this morning, usually of nice microscopic pic pictures. Um, so, um, and also, research institute like here, uh, Julian Foss Andre was, was uh, mentioned also this morning. Um, where a sculpture, his Angel of the West, is placed at the Scripps Research Institute, the Florida, Florida campus. Um, David Goodsell is at the uh, San Diego campus, La Jolla campus, but here the Fos Andres sculpture is in the Florida campus. And it's like a, a, I mean, it's a kind of icon for the Institute. So it's, you're asking the person to do an artwork. And science communicators believe that art enhances the public engagement with science. And it's a kind of sweetener that, that's, that's to help us swallow the pill of our science in a sense. Uh, which is, as I said, probably one of the reasons why the work and trust is uh, putting so much money in the science art program. So there are many particular interests of the stakeholder interests. 
um, out there. And what they have in common is that they see art as a way of promoting and supporting science or as another means of rejuvenating art. So these are the most important clusters of stakeholders, but they're also kind of interests on the interface per se. And I think one of the in so one such interface interest is based on the idea that creativity is a common denominator for art and science. There's a kind of widespread belief today that um, innovation, innovation here, is um, a kind of gener generative locomotive for the whole competitive economy, the kind of deus ex, ex machina for late capitalism. If we should have late capitalist work, we need more creativity and more, gener more innovation, and maybe art science could be our way out. Um, both scientists and artists are creative. Creative new ideas can be implemented with technical and social innovations and help the economy drive forward. So art and science and art science will help us beat the Chinese. That's a worthy idea, isn't it? And I don't say, don't, can I say it's not true, because all of you who get funding for your work know that this is one of the important ideas behind the, the funders, beat the Chinese. And I think this is the reasoning behind a place like David Edwards' art science venue in Paris, Le Laboratoire. Um, so this is what our, uh, uh, David Edwards, who wrote this book called Art Science, a couple of years ago, um, um, writes on his web page, idea development and culture in the education society can be conceived as a kind of experimentation where the catalyst for change, the movement for innovation, is a fusion of those creative processes we convene to think of as art and as science. This fused process, which I call art science, is the basis of the new current culture center, very open in center of Paris. Guess how many sponsors he had? He can't even, they feel the whole wall. And they are corporate sponsors, all of them. <coughs> this is a test bed for corporate sponsors. Do I sound critical here? Yes, I am. Never going down to be too many corporate sponsors. Um, so I think this is an, an important and bold idea that art science is a driving force for innovation and for late capitalism and for beating the Chinese. Um, and there is a lot of future money in it. But I must confess it's not why I am in the field. Um, um, I'm not there for selling science, I'm not there for, for rejuvenating art because I'm not basically an artist. And, um, and, um, and of course, having fun, that's, that's good, good enough. But if I should kind of raise myself a little above that, I should say, to, on, on a kind of final note, that I think my basic motivation for engaging with the art science scene is, I think it's the most important ingredient in education. And, and not education in terms of career training or the acquisition of competence for the work market that our uh, Minister of Education think is so important now, but education in terms of what the Germans call Bildung. Um, here's a quote from um, the uh, Encyclopedia of Our Times, Wikipedia, um, saying, Bildung is a process where an individual's spiritual and cultural sensibilities, as well as life, personal and social skills, are in the process of continual expansion and growth. Building is seen as a way to become more free during the higher self-reflection. It's it nice words, but there's a, a, some truth in that, I sense. Thank you. I mean, the idea here is to, the more you develop your cultural sensibilities and the more you reflect on the connections between them, the more you develop your ability to become a free and independent citizen, which is a precondition for democracy, right? Um, I mean, this was the idea of the classical uh, Humboldt University, of course, um, uh, back in the mid or early 19th century. And it became the later, later became the foundation for all the main research universities, the big Harvard, Yale, Stanford, um, uh, the uh, etc. Uh, that uh, all our um, university uh, politicians are looking forward to today. They have, they had their basis in this idea of build build on. Um, 
But I don't overestimate, uh, or, or I don't um, uh, um, I don't think I'd say too much when I say that building isn't particularly acknowledged by governance regimes of, of university today. Uh, university rapidly being restructured into kind of one-dimensional training institutions for a productive and efficient workforce. So university politicians and administrators have largely abandoned the notion of building today. I'm, I'm, I'm not suggesting a kind of educating a standard return to the classical Humboldtian universities two and a hundred years ago, but I think for democratic reasons, I believe that the notion of building has to be upheld, and I think its content has to be created anew for the coming decades. Oh, I have another ten minutes, but I will do it to two. Um, so, what is more appropriate for building in today's world than a combination of studying art and studying science? I mean, who would contest the claim that art and science, besides sport, is the major features of culture today? Art, science and sport, and that kind of beats everything, right? We take sport away because we're not talking sport today. Um, and religion, none of it, and, and nobody here is really religious probably anyway, so we can take religion away too. But these four are the main pillars of today's civilization, right? And we are here for art and science, and these are the two of the four main pillars. And isn't it the case then that the cultivation of artistic and scientific sensibilities, either on their own or together in different combinations, are indispensable for becoming a self-reflective world citizen in the classical notion of building. <laughs> so where can building, both in its most general meaning and more specifically in the meaning of self-reflection on art and science, where can building be take place these days? And here comes of course my, my self-aggrandizing conclusion. I mean, universities are deteriorating into vocational training schools. Okay, well, wait, we, we should give up trying to press a building component back into the university. But there are other institutions, museums, and Kunsthalle, and who are, I think are actually a better place for being institutions for life, life, lifelong education and building. Uh, so, Building museums and Kunsthallen together with changing online network ecosystems of the kind that Malina's talking about, blogs, tweets, Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, etc. Bring that together with the Kunsthallen and the museum. And I think we have the buildings institution of the 21st century where art and science, no religion, no sport, can thrive. Nevertheless, I realize it may be blowing in the wind, but, but I'm pretty sure about it, and that is that people will always try to understand the world around them and their place in the world, and their reflection on science art together will, because these are the two major modes of understanding the contemporary world, will become a major constituent, quote, in that kind of understanding of the world, independent of the current demise of the university as a building institution. You see, I read from a manuscript, so it's a... Uh, which I thought I should publish somewhere. Thank you.